Thank you. I'd like to uh, call this hearing to order um, and and just say briefly that the purpose of this hearing is, one, to um, uh, just have an overview of all the services we are providing to veterans in this state to determine if there are ways we can work together to actually enhance the uh, services we're providing um, and, uh, um, and, and to figure out how we do that. So what instead of having each of you testify separately and then ask questions of each, we changed the format slightly. I think you got a call late yesterday afternoon. What we'd like you to do is make your five to seven minute presentation because I think many of the questions that will be asked will cross over um, uh, some of your jurisdictions. So hopefully that will um, enable us to have a more meaningful conversation. So um, with that, um, we'd like to start out with um, Mark Lennon from the, uh, uh, the Deputy Secretary of Administration for the California Department of, of Veterans Affairs. Welcome. Good morning. In 2009, uh, the Bureau of State Audits uh, conducted an audit of our department um, and, and uh, assigned a, a lot of uh, corrective action, made a handful of observations. A lot of has happened uh, since 2009. I, I would describe uh, CalVet in a period uh, of transformation. And that transformation begins with uh, Secretary Gravitt, uh, who has taken the helm uh, of our department uh, eight months ago with a, a vision and a mission that is fundamentally different than the vision and mission uh, for our department previously. And it is a vision that contains things like innovation, 21st century, online services, uh, finding cost efficiencies and effectiveness. That, those are not uh, words that have previously uh, been associated with our department. So it all begins with, the, with that vision and that mission that the secretary uh, ha has developed. Now one of the core components to that, technology. 73% of all veterans, and this is a, a statistic from the federal VA, 73% of all veterans, they want to get online, not in line. That means 73% of veterans want to do business with us over the internet. That is not currently and has not historically been a, uh, a, a mechanism we've been able to provide for them. And, and for those of you who have uh, been in business, and I suspect many, many in this room have, 73% of your customers want to do business with you in a certain way and you're unable to do that, you're going out of business. So one of the things that uh, we are looking at doing um, and, and our vision uh, for, uh, for CalVet is to really develop that, that centralized point of entry for all veterans. This is uh, services, not silos. If you're a veteran and you want to apply for disability benefits, a college fee waiver, unemployment assurance, there really ought to be one place that you should go to be able to get that done. Um, it's the transparency of, of, of state agencies, whether a veteran is interacting with us, EDD, or the Department of uh, Health Care Services. Th that interaction with those departments, uh, quite frankly, should be transparent to them. So that, that's one of the things that uh, we are working on. In tandem with that is the Governor's Interagency Council on Veterans. Uh, it, it really is not just the template for uh, uh, breaking down those barriers for veterans, but it's a template for how government should run. Uh, and, and you heard me just uh, allude to services, not silos. The vision for the Interagency Council on Veterans is to make it so that a veteran can easily and quickly navigate all the benefits and services that are available to uh, him or her, uh, regardless of what department provides those. Uh, another thing that we're doing uh, with leveraging technologies, we've implemented an application called VetPro, a claims tracking system in all but three counties uh, in, in the state of California. Uh, what this does for us is it not only provides a consistent platform to be able to, uh, to do uh, claims management, but it solves some of those oversight problems that we've had in the past with being able to understand, you know, how many veterans are uh, uh, filing disability claims, what's the status of those disability claims, what's the success rate of those uh, disability claims. So that's something that we've been partnering closely with our, our county veteran uh, service officer counterparts in, uh, in rolling out and improving. Uh, the other thing is a, a mobile app. We're in 2012 and uh, you, you, uh, you heard me talk about uh, wanting to uh, interact with us online, not in line. Well, online now includes smartphones and, uh, and iPads. And uh, I'm shamelessly plugging an uh, award that we received uh, just recently from the Government Mobility Forum. We are the first uh, state veterans affairs agency in the country to roll out a mobile app to give uh, veterans the opportunity to interact with us uh, I in that way. And we received a uh, best of show at the uh, Government Mobility Conference for that. Uh, lastly, 
what I'd like to talk about is uh, you heard me talk about technology, and certainly that needs to be a focus area for us to be able to interact uh, and provide services to veterans. But it's not always going to be the silver bullet for having boots on the ground, if you can excuse the military parlance. And our boots on the ground are our county veteran services officers. We need to, uh, I would say, enhance, improve, and grow that partnership with the county veteran services officers who are really the frontline folks dealing with veterans as they uh, not only come home from wars like uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, but even our Vietnam vets who are you know, 30, 40 years later uh, looking to access some of their uh, benefits. And so we're going to uh, continue to enhance that partnership with our CVSOs uh, to ensure that uh, we have that, uh, that high-touch, hands-on um, interaction with, uh, with our state's veterans. And, uh, with that, I will uh, I will limit my uh, my remarks and then uh, open it up for future questions. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to ask us. We'll hold all of our questions till till we've heard all the testimony. So now we're, we we want to hear from the CVSOs, uh, Pete. Uh, Pete. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, members, and thank you very much for having this hearing because. Uh, uh, the more we can learn about how our veterans and how they can act services, the better. And I, I want to mention, though you don't see a lot of veterans in the audience in their hats, it's because they were here for two full days last week with the governor's veterans interagency, the veterans interagency, the interagency council on veterans. They keep changing the name on me, so it's hard to keep up with. Uh, and I'll forego my 20-page resume. So today I'm representing my clients, the California Association of County Veteran Service Officers. And I just want to point out, this, this is Code of Federal Regulations Title 38. That's what you need to be an expert in to file a fully developed or ready-to-rate claim for veterans. And there is a companion book that goes with this. So as Mark mentioned, we are the boots on the ground, and since the auditor's report in 2009, we have been forging a much closer relationship with CDVA, and the relationship between CDVA and CVSOs have, has never been uh, closer. Now, I'd like to say a few words about the CVSO model. This model actually goes back to the Civil War. And it started in California. Uh, the first one was opened in 1926 in San Bernardino after World War I and really took off after World War II. And why is that? Because, because of this. Because an average veteran can't file his own claim uh, without help from a well-trained and accredited representative. The CVSO model is used in approximately 28 to 30 other states. It is highly successful. It is also, for example, used in Texas and Florida. The difference being that uh, Texas and Florida spend significantly more funding on CVSOs. So the only other model is state employees. That's what's used in the majority of the other states and state employees would be tremendously more expensive than CVSOs. Now, part of the problem is, and I put a copy in your handout, is we, both CDVA and CVSOs have done a very poor job of giving the legislature information on what CVSOs do. And we're working to correct the reporting procedures and the information that you get uh, which you can get a lot more information, as Mark mentioned, for Vet Pro. And so I won't belabor that point. But it, for example, it doesn't even tell you what, how many claims got filed for veterans. So we're working with CDVA to address that. If you read the report, it seems like some counties are underperforming. And uh, since they are county employees, that's kind of, I think there are, let me just say this, I think there are problems in the reporting system that may give a skewed uh, impression. So we're going to try and get more information for you on that issue. Uh, there are two million veterans in the state of California, and we don't, know, we can't even begin to find 1.5 million of them. There is no common database at the federal or state level. 
DOD, VA, they hardly talk to each other. You get out of the service, DOD retires your records, you go file a VA claim, VA goes and gets the records from DOD, and if you never file a claim or access services, we don't even know who they are. So hopefully, through the Interagency Veterans Council, there will be legislative fixes where we can develop this common database under CDVA. And I would suggest that to break down the silos might be issues you might want to consider putting in your budget trailer bills because I think I think most of them can be done, a lot of them can be done that way. There are quite a few bills out there to give us more information on veterans, a driver's putting veteran on driver's licenses. Uh, so we know lots of veterans, we just don't have a common database. And, and the other key point is filing for veterans claims is not like filing for social security. It is not automatic. You have to, you, not all veterans are eligible for benefits. So it's not automatic and it is very difficult to file claims, it's a very detailed report. You have to provide medical evidence or fiscal evidence, and it's gotta be done one veteran at a time. There are a lot of things we can do through technology uh, to improve the system, deliver services better, notify veterans about services, but, but the payoff, it's gotta be done one veteran at a time, but the payoff is increased federal funding for California's veterans for the benefits they have earned. And for example, compensation. Compensation ought to be called, VA compensation ought to be called workers compensation because that's exactly what it is. You were injured on the job. And I'll finish with that and turn the mic over to Ted Pantilla. Okay, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, my name is Ted Pontillo. I'm the County Veteran Service Officer in Solano County. Uh, formerly, I was the Deputy Secretary for the California Department of Veteran Affairs and Vet Services. Um, our County Veteran Service Officers in California, there are approximately, or there are 58 counties in California. 56 of them have County Veteran Service Officer operations. So you have a network throughout the state, full coverage in every county, where somebody that needs veteran services can go and see a paid professional who's trained we have three training weeks a year. We're trained by the VA. We know what we're doing, and that's very important when you file a claim. There are approximately 1.7 million veterans in California. There are also approximately 1 million dependents of veterans in California. We're talking about their spouses and their children. These people are also eligible for veterans benefits education-wise and compensation-wise, and also pension. Um, we concentrate mostly on housing, education, health care, and employment. By employment, we network with our local EDD one stops. We're all at the county level. We meet with them on a regular basis. We cross-reference each other. And I think that synergy has really come to um, fruition in the last three years. Dennis and I, when we work together at, at CalVet and EDD, we have these people cross-referencing each other on, on every veteran. When they come in, first thing I say, do you have a job? Are you looking for a job? I get them to the EDD. They go into EDD, the first thing they say, are you getting your veterans benefits? And they cross-reference them to us. Um, our main focus is on compensation and pension. I think you'll see some numbers up there that show that our organization, the County Veteran Service Officers, we generate approximately $300 million in new dollars coming into this state from the feds last year. That's ongoing. When somebody gets a compensation for like 50%, maybe they'll get seven, $800 a month. They get that next year too, and they'll get that probably for the rest of their life. So that 300 million, if you use the multiplier effect, every year we get that new 300 million. That turns into billions of dollars after a couple of years. And that has been increasing over the past three years due to our partnership with CalVet. Um, they feed us information. They have a, a system, a common database that captures all of the uh, veterans' information with our partnerships with DMV. That information is filtered down to us we actually reach out and touch these people. And I have a, a AmeriCorps worker here in the audience that's gonna talk to you at when it's time for public 
comment that when we get that DMV information, we actually call that person, we write that person, we email that person, and get them to come into our office and make sure that they know about the benefits that they're entitled to. We also, uh, Mark mentioned the um, uh, Vet Pro system that we uh, initiated about three years ago that is almost uh, completely done now, where we're the only entity out there filing claims for veterans where CalVet can actually look and see what they're doing. They can see what kind of claims they're filing, the results of that claim, and you have that with no, no other organization. In fact, we're the only state in the union that has a universal system like that that tracks this type of activity, and I, I think it's cutting edge. Um, the other th good thing about VetPro is it's web-based, so when, we, when the VA goes to their paperless uh, claim filing, which they will in the next year, we will be ready to plug right into that where we'll eliminate all paper from the claim process. We scan documents and we email them to the VA. That's gonna speed up their process uh, 100%. We are trained professionals. As I said, we're trained three times a year. The one thing that you really don't want to do is have somebody that doesn't know what they're doing filing your claim for the VA. Uh, if that claim is denied, you're into about a two to three year process of trying to convince the VA that they were wrong when they denied it. So it's very important that you do it right and you include all the documentation that you need for that uh, claim. Our main thrust lately has been Medi-Cal cost avoidance. We have a program, we work with the Department <laughs> of Healthcare Services, you might hear from them later, where we're, they are giving us names of people who are on Medi-Cal in the state who are veterans. We actually, it's downloaded into VetPro, all we have to do is look, the contact information is there. We reach out and touch these Medi-Cal people and let them know that they have veterans benefits. We try to get them off Medi-Cal, try to get their medication through the VA, get their health care through the VA, and get them off the Medi-Cal dime. So for every dollar that you give us, we probably return $100 for every person we get off Medi-Cal through the VA system. So it's very important. Again, CVSOs are the only organization that's doing that in the state. We also go to TAP. I don't know if you're familiar with TAP, but it's Transitional Assistance Program. It's run by EDD. Uh, at Travis, where, where I work, uh, we see about 30, 40 people that are getting out of the service every week. And we have their service medical records there. We file claims for them on the spot even before they get out of the service. That's something that has never been done before. And our partnership with EDD makes that happen. So that, that percentage of um, people that are getting VA benefits is like on an uphill train big time because of our partnership. Uh, the older veterans, the people that are in assisted living uh, facilities and nursing ca uh, care homes, they really don't know about veterans' pension with aid and attendance. And that's a little known uh, benefit that can get them $1,700 to $2,000 for a married couple. Uh, $1,704 for a single veteran, $2,000 for a married couple. And it's tax free and it's for the whole time that they live, for the rest of their life. It's a huge benefit that's little known and we're out there promoting that. Um, Pete talked about additional funding. We have two sources of funding, I think, that would be interesting to you that would not be general fund money, and that's the Medicare cost avoidance. Uh, money comes through the Department of Healthcare Services. I think it originates with the feds. And if we can show that we can get more people off Medi-Cal and get them into the VA healthcare system, I think uh, getting some money out of the feds to do that would be uh, something that we could do and not tap the general fund. The other thing is our new license plate. I don't know if you've seen it, but we changed it last year. Instead of saying veteran on it, it says honoring veterans. It has a new design. And the County Veteran Service Officer Organization gets $28 for every plate that is renewed. Uh, right now, it's gen it was generating about 800000 a year. I think it's now it's over um, $1.2 to $1.3 million. And we don't have that many plates on the road for the uh, almost 2 million veterans in the state. We have, I think, about 30,000 plates so this is an opportunity, if it's marketed properly, where we could make money and support our organization, get more boots on the ground and resources without any general fund money. So I can answer any questions afterwards. Thank you. Before we move to the next speaker, I just want to welcome Assemblyman Bloomfield, who chairs the uh, main budget committee. So thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to move on to the Employment Development Department and uh, Dennis Petrie, who's the Deputy Director of Workforce uh, Development Branch and the Employment Development Branch, the Development Department will speak. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, esteemed members of this committee. Um, I am Dennis Petrie, Deputy Director of the California Employment Development Department. The Employment Development Department has administrative and service delivery responsibility for the majority of federal DOL-sponsored job training and education programs in the state of California. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, the majority of the job training and education programs, federal programs uh, in California are administered um, by the Workforce Services Branch, uh, of which I am the Deputy Director. Um, the only other program is the Unemployment Insurance Program and the um, Unemployment Insurance for Ex-Military Members, and that's run independently um, at EDD out of our Unemployment Insurance uh, Branch Program. Um, we have responsibility for a number of programs. Just to highlight a few, um, we uh, oversee the Jobs for Veterans State Grant Program. Um, that is a staffing grant from the U.S. Department of Veteran Employment and Training Services. Um, and that grant uh, funds the Disabled Veteran Outreach Program Specialists and the Local Veteran Employment Program Representatives who are co-located in approximately 200 one-stops throughout the state of California. We have administrative responsibility for the Workforce Investment Act program in concert with the California Workforce Investment Board, and that is the uh, federal program that created the one-stop career center system throughout the state. Um, we administer what used to be called uh, the Discretionary uh, Workforce Investment Act discretionary grants. Um, however, as most folks in this audience uh, are keenly aware, um, the federal government in the last two budget cycles have reduced that program and presently um, uh, it uh, is not slated for um, uh, additional funding. We oversee the Wagner-Pizer Act program. That's the program that um, is uh, known as the Employment Services or Job Services Program. Those are EDD staff that uh, provide a variety of job training and educational programs. Um, for uh, job seekers and attempt to match job seekers uh, with employers um, that are uh, uh, looking to hire. Um, and uh, the Wagner-Pizer program um, does serve veterans in addition to the uh, DVOP and LVR program. Again, EDD um, administers the employment insurance for ex-service programs in addition to traditional unemployment insurance. And uh, I'm pleased to report, Madam Chair, uh, that yes, there is a box on the initial UI claim that allows veterans to self-identify. Um, the uh, EDD embarked upon, in concert with um, a number of other state and local entities, uh, what is called the Job for Veterans, uh, excuse me, the Honor a Hero, Hire a Vet, um, Job, Career, and Resource Fairs. EDD has a, has a vision of integrated services delivery, um, a strong commitment to cooperation, collaboration, and partnership, um, all targeting um, the end goal of optimizing our services and our benefits um, for the veterans and their families in California. The Honor a Hero, Hire a Vet, uh, uh, the Job Fair and Resource Fair program is a great example of that collaboration. It includes the California Department of Veterans Affairs, the Department of Industrial um, Relations, um, the community college systems, the CSU system. Um, we reach out to employers to participate in that, and we have created relationships with the Society of Human Resources, uh, Society of Human Resource Management. Um, that is the Association of Human uh, Relations and Resources Professionals in most of the large-scale businesses in California. Um, we fund the uh, Honor a Hero, Hire a Vet job fairs uh, with what's called Workforce Investment Act 25% uh, additional assistance dollars. These are dollars that target services to dislocated workers and of course recently separated recently separated veterans um, do fit under the definition of dislocated workers. In March of 2011, um, EDD uh, continued its effort in continuous quality improvement and focused um, a major effort with the California Department of Veterans Affairs on re-engineering our DVOP and LVR program. Some of the major highlights that are the result of that reorganization and re-engineering is establishing um, performance benchmarks for our case managers, um, using a triage approach to veterans as they come into the one stops, using what's called a veteran service navigator who 
uh, initially contacts and works with the veterans as they come into the one-stop center to assess their needs as well as their job skills and then helps them navigate throughout a one-stop to get to the services and the programs that will most positively impact and respond to the ne their need and the need of their family. We've expanded our professional training for our staff and our partners. We've expanded our outreach to veterans that includes uh, participation in events such as yellow ribbon events, stand downs, and of course our Honor a Hero Hire a Vet resource fairs. Working in concert with the California Department of Veterans Affairs, we've created what's called the reintegration form. And that is a form that our veterans, when EDD delivers the transitional assistance program, um, our veterans that are soon to be returning to California complete a form that allows us to get real-time data. Where are they living? How can we contact them? Um, it is uh, linked to the DMV program uh, that was created last year. It is an effort that California has embarked upon to identify and build the database that Pete so eloquently um, uh, spoke that is lacking, uh, not only nationally, but lacking in California. Um, we have uh, established memorandums of understanding with the California Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, we are a participant in the Interagency Council on Veterans. EDD would like to thank, CDV and EDD would like to thank that Governor Brown uh, drafted that executive order in response to reading our supplemental report in terms of how to better coordinate and integrate programs in California. Um, we participate uh, with our local one-stop operators in the new Gold Card Initiative, Gold Card Initiative that has uh, recently been um, uh, signed into law and sponsored by the Obama administration. Uh, we market the work opportunity tax credits that are um, associated with uh, hiring veterans. And our labor market information division at EDD has created um, a specific website called Vocations for Vets that help uh, crosswalk the certifications and the occupations that service uh, our military personnel uh, operated uh, while they were in the military and helps crosswalk how that um, will translate into the civilian um, workforce. Um, the Employment Development Department does have our Cal Jobs program that is a uh, comprehensive labor exchange system um, uh, uh, linking employers with uh, veterans and other job seekers. And EDD is also um, bringing forth for all of our, our veterans the um, access to a number of the job boards and initiatives that have been developed at, at the federal level. Um, we are happy to be invited to this um, hearing and uh, look forward to our continued good faith efforts of uh, collaboration, cooperation, and partnership with all of our uh, partner entities and agencies throughout the state of California. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and our last guest speaker is Renee Mala, the Chief of the Medi-Cal Eligibility Division. Thank you. Um, hello, Madam Chair and members. My name is Renee Mala. Um, I am with the Department of Healthcare Services, and the Department of Healthcare Services is a single state agency which oversees the administration of the Medi-Cal program here in the state. And I thank you for the opportunity today to come and speak before the committee on the DHCS efforts regarding the Paris Project. I do want to first acknowledge um, our delay in releasing the final legislative report and that because of this, I'm only able to speak on general efforts of the project, but once the report is formally released, the department does welcome the opportunity to meet and further discuss the findings. <laughs> in terms of the Paris project, it is an information uh, sharing data match system that's operated by the federal government, which allows states and federal agencies to verify public assistance client circumstances affecting Medicaid program eligibility. The Paris Veterans Match allows states to compare beneficiary information with the United States Department of Veterans Affairs. And in um, Ju July uh, 1st, 2009 through June 30th, 2011 is when we began our two-year Paris pilot project in accordance with state statute that was enacted for this effort. We do work in partnership with our colleagues with the California Department of Veterans Affairs on the implementation of this veterans match, and we do have an MOU with the department, and we have um, specified responsibilities that are outlined in that MOU. 
In particular, DHCS is responsible for doing the data match with the federal government, and then we filter these results for high-cost veterans, and that may be individuals who may be identified in terms of receiving long-term care services under the Medi-Cal uh, program, or they may be in aid codes that identify them as an individual who may be a senior or who may have um, a disability. And also we look at um, information that may indicate that a person is likely to be eligible for VA benefits. And then this information is um, sent over to CDVA on a quarterly basis. Based upon the information that we send out, then CDVA sends this information to the selected pilot counties that participate in our pilot project. And then those referrals are um, transmitted to local county veteran services officers who then provide DHCS with outcome data. Um, the outcome data is reported to us that allows us the ability to assess whether or not um, the pilot was um, successful in terms of reaching um, out to veterans who have um, who are enrolled in the Medi-Cal program and who may also be subsequently eligible for um, VA health coverage. When we started the pilot back in July of 2009, we started with three counties, and it was Fresno, San Bernardino, and San Diego. Um, in mid-2010, we did expand the pilot to seven additional counties. Those counties were Alameda, Orange, Sacramento, San Mateo, San Francisco, and Santa Clara, and Solano. In terms of um, the general pilot results, what I would like to report out is that the project was successful in identifying veterans that are duly enrolled in both the Medi-Cal program and in the VA, um, and who were enrolled in the Medi-Cal program and who also had VA services. And it was successful in terms of the local outreach that was done by the CVSOs and reaching out to the veterans to discuss the VA benefits um, that they may avail themselves of rather than being enrolled on the Medi-Cal program. Outreach um, that was provided by the local CVSOs um, resulted in about 25 percent. The outreach that they had conducted um, was on approximately 25 percent of the referrals that were sent to them by DHCS. In terms of the cost savings for this program, uh, we did demonstrate a cost savings of approximately $210,000 in total funds um, in our um, local assistance uh, budget that was released back in November of 2011. So for the fiscal budget year, we've identified some savings of $210,000 in total funds. Um, and this is based upon individuals who were enrolled in the Medi-Cal program <coughs> and who may have been in managed care arrangements. And because they did um, seek to discontinue their Medi-Cal eligibility, then we were no longer paying capitated payments for those individuals under the Medi-Cal program. Um, and while this may not seem uh, to be a high amount of savings, this is because we only account for savings in the Medi-Cal program based upon ca on a cash basis, but we were able to see and demonstrate it, and you'll see this in our Paris report findings, that we did have some modest success in terms of cost avoidance with the program. But because we have cost avoidance, we don't budget that in our Medi-Cal budget. Um, it's just on a cash basis that we um, account for our, our savings. In terms of the funding for this program, we do have funding of approximately $956,000 that's authorized under state statute today. And this uh, funding um, is between the department and CDVA for purposes of um, claiming federal funds, but then also um, a majority of that funding is used to help fund uh, the CVSOs at the local office. And this funding is provided primarily for the CVSOs providing um, assistance to local county welfare departments in terms of um, verifying veteran status for the Medi-Cal applicants. This, this funding arrangement has been in place for several decades now, and it is separate and apart from the MOU project. Uh, that we currently have in place with um, CDVA. But it is a source of funding that is available um, to the local CVSOs. And that money, the general fund is carried in the VA department and then we're able to pull down um, the same amount in terms of federal funding under the Title 19 Medicaid program. 
So in summary, we do believe that um, the, pol the pilot has demonstrated modest, su modest success with some of the veterans choosing the VA health services over the Medi-Cal program. More research is needed to demonstrate the cause and effect of the CVSO outreach efforts and veterans making decisions on maintaining their Medi-Cal eligibility. Prior to the um, Paris uh, Veterans Project, um, individuals would just self-report to us on their applications to the Medi-Cal program as to whether or not that they are a veteran, a veteran and this is just um, an optional field that they can report to us. Um, we did look at some other states in terms of successes or best practices, and we have found that in Washington State and in Texas, they do provide outreach entities with a percentage of demonstrated savings as an incentive for outreach. And the return on investment would need to be further explored in California given the geographic differences and the availability of services for veterans both under the Medi-Cal and the VA healthcare system. The one thing I want to note is that for purposes of the Medi-Cal program, we don't have an ability to um, require someone to disenroll from the program because they may have other health care coverage. But one of the things that can be further explored is the outreach and education that is provided to the veterans on the benefits of using the VA services versus the Medi-Cal program. A couple of things to note is that under the Medi-Cal program, for individuals, depending upon what their income is or what their resources and assets may be, they may have what we call share of cost Medi-Cal. So they may have to spend down on those resources or assets prior to having Medi-Cal eligibility and for Medi-Cal paying for covered services that they may seek under the Medi-Cal program. And this is not something that would occur under the VA health system. Another consideration is also under the Medi-Cal program, for individuals that are in long-term care services, once they are deceased, the state has the ability to do a state recovery against their estate for services that may have been provided if individuals were in long-term care. So this could have an impact on the estate and um, additional monies that may be available to their families after an individual is deceased. Um, we do um, believe that ongoing collaboration with CDVA is critical in terms of ensuring a successful statewide implementation and that we need to coordinate efforts both, both at the state and the local level in terms of outreach efforts that can be effectuated in making this a more successful uh, project throughout the state of California. So again, I thank you all for the opportunity to come and present today. And again, I recognize the limitation of the information I can provide, but I do look forward to discussing the um, findings of the pilot project, and I do welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Assembly Rib Bloomfield, do you have questions? Yes. Go ahead. Um, and before I question, I want to thank you for uh, having me in your hearing. Uh, as, as you know and the other chairs know, there's there's 60 subcommittee hearings scheduled between now and the May revise. And as the budget chair, I try to to come in and out of as many of the sub chair subcommittee hearings as I can, um, both so to help me get acquainted with it, to work with the sub chairs, uh, and particularly when there's issues of, of importance. And, and obviously nothing's more important than, than our veterans. Uh, it's an extremely important issue. And, and it was one or two things that I was really astonished by and I wanted to, to bring up here and and when we talk about you know one of our goals across the board in the budget is is leveraging federal funds I mean that's how we you know it's one of the few ways as a state that we can get money without raising taxes or cutting services uh, and we need to do obviously a better job of that on the you know with VA benefits especially and looking through the chart one thing I just I couldn't get my head around is the difference, the discrepancy among counties of, of the veteran population and the payouts. You look at Placer County versus LA County, and they have, uh, and obviously this one strikes me because I'm a uh, LA resident and represent LA. Placer County has about 10 times fewer uh, veterans, and yet they have in absolute annual payouts more than four times as many payouts. When you, when you do that on a per person basis, flat, uh, Placer County is getting about eight hundred and four dollars uh, per veteran, and LA is getting twenty-one dollars. Uh, I mean, that's doesn't make any sense. Either they're doing something very right, or LA is doing something very wrong. 
Um, and then it's the same thing across the board. There's there's vast discrepancies among the counties. So I want to know how we can we can you know ultimately get everyone up to where Placer is, and if not higher. Um, and then just a couple other issues I just want to throw out there. Um, you know it, this whole mix. I mean, in terms of how many uh, VA state folks we have working on increasing benefits versus I know we have about 68 percent of our folks are just dedicated to um, veterans homes and we have you know less than in absolute PYs I think there's le there's only 40 out of the 2200 PYs that we have that are dedicated to getting more VA benefits <laughs> um, it seems one of those things it's like you know hiring more meter maids why don't we you always wonder it's the kind of thing you want to do as many as much as you can because you're gonna be able to get it will pay for itself so why is that that way? And then the last comment I'll make, even though I've got a dozen questions, but I won't take up all the time, is just the, the I wanted to say a positive thing, the Honor a Hero, Hire a Veteran is a great program. We did that in my district. We had, you know, thousands of job opportunities, uh, and we had, you know, multiple thousands of veterans uh, come to that uh, workshop or that, that forum, and it was very successful, and, and I encourage that continued work. But I'll, I'll throw those two, two topics out there. I mean, can I start briefly? Uh, part of the problem in that, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for attending and, the, and these very important questions. Part of the problem is, again, as I mentioned, not all vel veterans are eligible for benefits. So the amount of veterans in a, in a county doesn't necessarily translate to the amount of veterans that are eligible for claims. Uh, but there is data, I believe, on the VA website that will tell you how many veterans in each county are getting uh, benefits and also how much those benefits are. So we really, you gotta be really careful about all these comparisons to number of veterans and to how many. So you, I mean, the consultants have done a wonderful job of beginning to dig in to find out the answers, but they're, we have a, uh, we need to keep digging down deeper. And now I'm gonna let Ted talk about Placer. Well, if I could uh, mention Placer County, it's sort of an anomaly in that the person that's the County Veteran Service Officer there, he has a, uh, he has this private company that he works with that goes around to all of the uh, assisted living facilities in California and sort of farms people that are veterans out of there and gets them to file claims and then they mail him the claims. So he, you know, where a normal county would do maybe 10 or 12 pension with aid and attendance claims a month or a week, he will do 100, 200. And so he's, he's getting claims from all over the whole state and processing them through his office, which sort of skews the numbers. What is he getting out of it? He gets seven, about $17 a claim. So his subvention is inordinately high and it's just what he does and it works. So he's filing, not all that money goes to Placer County. He's filing claims in LA, San Diego, but he, you know, on his stats, he gets credit for those. So it's a technique that some people use to, um, they file claims in other counties using uh, private companies that filter him the claims and that's how that, that works. Now LA, and it's, it's all legal. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. He's just a very ingenuitive type of guy, but, um, LA County they are low because they have they have about 383,000 veterans and I think they have about 10 or 12 vet reps for that whole area so their caseload is about 50,000 veterans per one in Solano County I have 40 40,000 veterans I have three vet reps including myself so it's about 15 14 15,000 veterans per rep in LA there are about 50,000 veterans per rep so that's where the boots on the ground are important, and that's why LA is fairly low compared to the amount of uh, people they have. So can I pass a follow-up question before you get to the September 2nd question? <coughs> so when I look at the stats of the Department of Veteran Affairs, it's showing um, 1,033 uh, ongoing payments, I guess, for the veterans in LA, 203 uh, one-time benefits obtained, and then you take a look at Placer at 1,900. So are we saying that out of how many vets did you say we had in LA County? Three. About three hundred eighty thousand. Out of three hundred eighty thousand, we've only reached out to. 
No. What, what, what is the right number there? What we're saying is that because of the limitations on the report, you, you just see the results of successful claims being filed. You do not receive any information on how many claims are actually being filed. There are a couple other areas where LA is unique. Because uh, the Veterans Administration has a, uh, a regional office in LA, Sometimes the uh, the LA doesn't necessarily report all its claims to CDVA. This vet pro system is really very new. So, but for example, we had a hearing last year, and the American Legion came in here and said we get seventy five percent of our claims are handed off to from the CVSOs. So the CVSO hands off a claim to the American Legion. The American Legion claims it and other uh, veterans organizations, and the CVSOs do not get the credit for it. So that's one of, the, one of the things we'll be working for. Because there's a regional office in L.A., I believe that what L.A. is reporting is under-reporting. Is there any report that will give us the benefits that are received for veterans by the county in which they live, regardless of whether they're processed by, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think we ought to clone this guy who can file claims yeah. for $70 he's, he's, dollars a veteran because good. that means that, you know, but regardless of whether they're, they're filed by this gentleman or the CVSO or anyone else, is there any way of knowing how many veterans in each county are receiving some type of benefit. It's on the VA website. You, we can get you that information. Thank you. And I won't. Yeah, I know you no, have. That, no, that, have that's a, that's exactly the follow up. And, and I mean, is is that discrepancy on the VA website as as stark as it is? I mean, you know, eight hundred dollars per person versus twenty one is it's that's not a little discrepancy. Though. No, it would be even because they don't care who files the claim at the VA. They just say. There's so many veterans in, in L.A., and this is how many get VA benefits. It's still low. It's not as low as, and Placer would not be as high. This is just the claim activity that that office is doing. So he has skewed the numbers by taking them from all over the state. I think, so you had a second question, correct? Well, I mean, the second question was was related in terms of the, the mix of, it's, it's related to the general issue of, of how do we beef up our, our claims here, and why is the mix so, you know, when you have 40 PYs out of 2,200 PYs and only 40 are going toward expanding uh, VA claims, is that a good ratio? Or, I mean, am I wrong in my logic that that, that should be higher? Just And that's just sort of intuitive logic, and I want to understand from the people who actually live and breathe this stuff if 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 you agree with that logic or there's a reason why that's that number is so low well actually it's uh, even starker mr chairman because for example if you look at the pys uh six of them i believe are at the cemetery so they file very few claims at the cemetery except for death benefits and headstones then in uh, the CDVA employees that work at the three VA regional offices mainly get their claims from CVSOs. So and I'll let Ted talk about that a little. How you? I think Mark is probably the. I I, I can speak to that. Um, I, on the face of it, you you look at it, and you say, well, 40 PYs to be able to uh, expand outreach and provisioning of services to veterans. That is a low number. Yeah. Uh, 34, you say. Right. Uh, um, that said, it, it, it goes with a understanding of the history of our department, which has been fundamentally focused around homes and farm and home loans. Uh, now, certainly, we are looking for opportunities to grow uh, and expand our ability to reach out to veterans and get them the, those services they deserve. Uh, that said, you know, in increasing budget climates, we're, we're looking to do more with less, which I know is cliche, um, and that speaks to some of the, uh, the technology-related uh, initiatives you heard me mention earlier. Um, again, not a silver bullet, but certainly is uh, what I would consider a low-cost, high-return way 
to uh, to increase uh, getting those benefits and those those disability claims filed. Um, so uh, the the answer to that is forty could always do. We could absolutely do with uh, with more individuals, boots on the ground, folks at our headquarters to help uh, to manage these uh, these veterans who are are, are filing claims. Um, that said, don't have them, um, and we're looking for creative, innovative ways to uh, uh, extend those services in this environment. But is there any way to repurpose some of the twenty two hundred? Yeah, I, that that is something that uh, we, as a department, uh, are looking at in terms of creating efficiencies and restructure and reorganization. It is part of our strategic plan. Um, uh, I don't have any additional details uh, other than it is something that we have begun to look at um, with the uh, with the new plan that we have. But uh, I have a number of questions, but I know some of Wagner has some questions. That well, actually, we're on exactly the subject I wanted to ask about, and appreciate the question from the chairman. You mentioned, Mr. Connedy, counties that are underperforming, and I guess you know we're talking about it, and maybe we can figure out how which counties are underperforming, and you know look on the website and get information that would be better than what we, you know, more focused than what we have here. But I guess my question is to you, well, to, all, to the entire panel, is there something you would like from the legislature that would help? bring some of the underperforming counties up to the level or is it just you know is this you know, what can we do to help is there a legislative fix is there something else you'd like from us realizing the budget well CDVA has the ability to go audit com counties and to help provide training to them and to assist them for example vet pro is uh, very new and that is proving to be very <laughs> beneficial uh, the in, the really easy answer would be more money for county veteran service officers but but we don't think that's going to happen for a while so so we just need to keep working better uh, with the CDVA but you know you most of you know who your county supervisors are and can pick up the phone and give them a call. A couple okay. items uh, I, I would add to that, um, and, and this is in close collaboration with the CVSOs. Uh, one of the things that uh, we as a department would like to collaborate uh, with the CVSOs on is, um, you know, how can we better change the formula to allocate the money to the highest performers? How can we incentivize those counties who are low performing to become high performing? How can we train those lower performing counties, as, as we would say in the military, how do you train them to a standard? How do you train everybody to a standard so that they uh, know how to uh, uh, submit a claim with the same level of competency as a Placer County? Uh, that is something that uh, is beyond uh, just the conceptual stage that we are moving forward with. Um, and then lastly, you, you mentioned Placer County. I'm a firm believer in best practices. If there's somebody in Placer County who knows how to do it right, let's co-op that, that guy or gal and uh, let's let's have he or she train uh, to a standard and uh, and have them do road shows around the state. I, I think that would be an enormous opportunity to leverage lessons learned from uh, from those highest performing counties and bring them out to some of the others that uh, might need some uh, additional attention. Thank you, so Member Dickinson. Do you have questions? Yeah, and I was going to switch um, focus. Uh, so if there's that's okay, I, I'm going to come. I can come back to the focus after because I have a general question that I think links all of them together. Okay. okay. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, I share the sentiments that have been expressed about uh, about the the claims. Um, and I would just say, Mr. Lennon, that you mentioned a number of things that you'd like to do. I think we'd be interested in how they're going to get done. Um, but that's maybe for another day. I wanted to switch to the to, to a couple questions about the Veterans Employment Services and the and the Paris project. Um, with respect to the em employment services. Um, you, you mentioned a number of things that have been expanded or insti instituted. I'm not sure when those things occurred, but uh, I'd like to start out by asking whether you have any measurable results as a result of, of implementing the things that you uh, de delineated. Uh, thank you, Assembly Member Dickinson. 
Um, the um, there's generally a data lag from this time from the time by which you begin to implement a particular intervention or new service delivery model and that you're able to actually collect the data and present the data um, in terms of uh, we are seeing um, increased uh, performance by our uh, DevOps and LVRs I think one of the um, key achievements that we were able to achieve is to be able to put um, performance benchmarks before um, our um, uh, DevOps and LVRs. I think um, an example of the conversation with regard to um, the gentleman from uh, Placer County. Um, in the past, uh, the state, um, due to collective bargaining agreements, had been um, um, at a disadvantage to be able to uh, put like a uh, you know a target um, or a uh, particular goal but through um, much negotiations with SEIU 1000 um, we were able to achieve agreement that we could put benchmark targets we can't necessarily um, tell each person that they have to achieve X but we shoot an overall goal um, we've seen that as a result of giving everybody or putting a benchmark goal, um, the, the uh, services uh, rendered to the veterans um, and the outcomes um, appear to us to be increasing. Um, uh, I guess the old saying is the proof is in the pudding. Now when I'm able to capture that data and analyze the data at the um, conclusion of a particular given um, fiscal year, um, we're at a better place to, uh, to, to examine whether our anecdotal evidence is um, demonstrating itself in, in the hard facts. But yes, um, we're seeing in our offices um, increased activity and um, better performance outcomes as a result of the changes that we've made. What, what is your anecdotal evidence? Um, that our uh, the veteran service offer through, through a number of through, through a number of enhancements for instance um, as I talked previously about the introduction of the reintegration form as a result of the reintegration form um, now we have a database that allows our DevOps and LVRs um, to be more proactive in actually uh, reaching out to these men and women um, versus um, a more passive type of a system whereby you're in a one-stop waiting for the uh, service member or their family to come in to you. By capturing the data through the reintegration forms, by doing the Honor Hero Hire uh, Vet events, um, and capturing the data, getting the new data from the DMV, um, we're more effectively building a database that can be used by all of the partner organizations um, to do that kind of outreach. Um, I liken it, and I think uh, some of the, the members can probably um, uh, see the analogy. Um, I, I used to do a fair bit of um, uh, electoral politics in another life. So the, the, it's, it's like finally we're getting a voter file and being able to do phone bank operations and email operations and get out of our offices and go and see the vets or call the vets in their home. And, uh, and that is a hugely um, uh, new innovation that we believe is going to produce better results for us all around. If you can find these men and women early on, bring them in and assess them for their needs and also um, their, their occupational skills and their talents, then we're quicker to match them up to the services and the benefits that, that they're required or that they're, they're entitled to. So you, you've been at this for, for some time. We have uh, only anecdotal data as, as you've de described it. What we do seem to have is, according to the figures available, the information that that uh, we're lagging uh, the national average fairly substantially in in placing veterans into employment who we have contact with or aware of, uh, and the question is: Are we are we improving on that? Are we are we getting better uh, more than anecdotally, but but uh, measurably? Uh, I don't know if you're going to have some data. Uh, you mentioned fiscal year, but it certainly as we come back to this this budget unit, it would yeah. be 
would be desirable to have some feedback that's uh, that's uh, a numerical and demonstrable with respect to where we are in changing, if at all, the employment rate for for our veterans compared to other states. Um, that's a a very good uh, assessment. Um, as I, um, I I guess to kind of echo um, Pete. Um, of course, you've got to look at the numbers, and, and you, you can't look at entered employment rates, Mr. Assemblymember, without also looking at what the state of the economy is in, the, in, in, in um, these various states that we're being compared to. Yesterday I had the opportunity, and I do have um, some data and some information that, uh, that, that provides a, a better uh, depiction on um, California's economy and job growth and creation as it um, pertains to uh, the rest of the nation and any particular state that um, California could be compared with. Um, just to, to give you a, a, a sense, um, California has, um, uh, for the better part of the last four years, um, had an unemployment rate that is three to four percent higher than what the national rate is and could be in some some respects is five percent higher than what is um, is the unemployment rate in, in Texas and so if your state um, if we're not creating the jobs and don't have the same opportunities to put veterans in the jobs uh, based upon the economic uh, situation and environment in other states then absolutely you're you're going to lag and if you'd be interested, I do have copies um, of coffee. this particular data set uh, comparing the economy um, for any of the members that would be happy to receive it. Well, I, I appreciate Obviously, there are uh, individual characteristics that vary state to state in terms of economic performance. But if, if I look at figures that say California is 17 percent behind Texas in entering the entered employment rate, uh, 12 percent behind the national average, while some of that may be due to the different employment climate state to state, it, on the face of it, it does, would not seem to explain the entirety of that discrepancy. Um, I couldn't argue that perspective at this particular point. Um, it, um, but that's just trying to do a simple math and every percentage that your unemployment rate is higher than another I mean it's not an apples to apples comparison it, you be, as a result of a one percent unemployment rate higher than another state um, I, I don't think that it would be an appropriate conclusion to say that then the when you're comparing entered employment rates on um, the outcome of your program that you should only see a one percent difference. Well, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that there's necessarily direct correlation that's that's applicable here. But I, I'm suggesting that 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 distinction between the two is is more than just a simple deviation explained by difference in economic performance in the in the various I, states. I, I will say, you know, we, and we can pass out your charts later. What what the charts do show is that our our veteran unemployment rate is declining at the same rate as these other states. It's just their overall employment rates are lower. So, you know, if you want to take a look at the rate at which they're putting veterans back to work and the rate at which we are, the, the, the shapes of the curves are very much the same. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't need to do more to put our veterans back to work, but but I do think it's, you know, at least it's, we, it's fair to take a look at uh, that overall picture. would love to have data. Yeah. But we always I, love that man. And there, it, what, but I do want. I, I know that w we tend to focus primarily upon the entered employment rate. I do want to say that when you do compare California to the national average, and when you do compare California to other states like Texas or Florida, um, those veterans in California that um, that that do get an entered employment, um, the wage gain, uh, the wages that. Uh, California, the data also will demonstrate that California is placing veterans in better paying and higher wage jobs than is taking place in, in, other, na in other parts of, of the country. Yeah, um, I know I get we, we tend to have to respond to the entered employment rate, and um, there's very little focus on the, the, the actual outcome from the type of a job that the, um, the, the, the veteran gets. Um, we are fairly proud at this particular point that um, our average wage for veterans I exceeds Florida and exceeds um, 
taxes by about five thousand dollars per person. Mm -hmm. but our average wage in general exceeds other those states as well. We have a different we're economy. a higher right. cost of living right. state. It, it's my understanding from previous discussions on these topics that there had been a commitment to put much more emphasis on case management. Uh, and I am curious if you, I know you mentioned it, you didn't describe it or elaborate on it too much. I'm, I'm curious about what what is occurring and how much in the way of resources is being put into, into case management. Well, um, the JVSG, the Jobs for Veterans State Grant, um, uh, actually requires uh, those veterans that have a service disability or have indicated a greater need. I, I hate the words, but it's barriers to employment. Um, the, the, the program model is very prescribed. It's uh, prescribed by the, the federal government. And so in a DVOP, the, the DVOP program, which is the program whereby um, particular veterans get case managed, there's like an e eligibility assessment that's done. So um, typically those veterans that are case managed are those veterans that have um, more barriers or more obstacles to, to overcome than the uh, than than those veterans that don't. When the you're look the data set that is before you when you're looking at the 33 to 45 percent, um, that too is specific to the DVOP and the case managed system. Um, I've looked at some data that I, I don't have before me, but when I look at um, uh, the, the veteran that is, it, it, I'm not sure what the outcome or the reason is, but it's somewhat startling to me because what I find is that uh, those veterans that um, seem to be assigned to the DVOP because they have um, more barriers that need to be overcome um, don't end up getting the same outcomes. When I compare the case managed veteran to the overall workforce investment program, um, and I look at the Wagner Pizer program, um, veterans in, in those particular programs, uh, their entered employment is reaching about 47 to, uh, their entered employment is about 47, 48. But when you look at these across the board, um, our, our numbers uh, and the uh, data that we have before us is just showing um, even veterans and non-veterans, I mean, they're all tracking basically the same way. Um, in 2008, we were achieving 78 and 80 percent entered employment rates, even on you know non-veterans and the broader population. But then, when you look at today, and it is a result of the economy, we've gone from about 80 percent entered employment, and we're now tracking down at around the 50s. So the trends are are, are similar. Um, and at this particular point, my attribution uh, tends to be. Um, whether or not the veteran is job ready and I I employable, and if all the uh, ancillary barriers um, are have been attended to, that then put the veteran um, in a potential applicant pool um, that is equal to everybody else in the applicant pool, and that's not generally the case with those men and women who are being case managed. Well, is it, the, is it the case that all veterans who are screened and determined to fit the characteristics that would make them eligible for case management are receiving case management? Yes, sir. All right. And I, I think, again, if we can get data on that as we come back to this budget, you know, that, that would be very helpful. And finally, yeah. I, I just wanted to ask a, a question or two about the Paris pilot project. Um, the report was due November 1st. Do you, have an, uh, do you have a projection of when we will actually see this report? I would like to say in March. It will be soon. You'd like to say. Would you say that? Yes, I would. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, so, again, I won't, I won't go any deeper into this in a moment, but, again, with the expectation that we'll have that report, um, perhaps we can come back to, to, to this subject. Because what I'm interested in and not necessarily pursuing today is you described uh, 200000 ish in um, savings uh, and cash um, and described that as, as modest. The background information seems to suggest that some states have, have done uh, quite well in terms of essentially shifting cost uh, or bringing federal money into, into their state. And I'm very interested in um, the ways in, in which 
the department believes the pilot project has either validated mm -hmm. um, what other states are doing and we should just simply be doing more of it better uh, or, or ways in which um, there are distinctions seen between what circumstances exist here in California and, and those of other states. I think I have a Thank few you. questions, and and I want to say that my goal isn't shifting costs. It's making sure the veterans who are entitled to benefits mm -hmm. get the benefits, you know, because you have men and women who, um, you know, put their lives on the line to defend our, our liberties and our freedoms, and if there are benefits that they should be receiving, it's our job to make sure that, that they're there. And I recognize that, you know, you'll never have 100 percent of the veterans – who are receiving benefits because some come home and they go into private business or whatever and they, you know, they move on with their lives. But there are others. I have my my sister's father-in-law. His uh, his Medicare is through or Medicare uh, Medicare Medicare is Medicare eligible, but also his medical uh, treatments that he gets is through the VA because of the you know the, the high level of care and, and the program that they have. So um, I I sort of like to. I've had conversations with most of you. But I also I'd like to ask you to get a little bit out of your comfort zones because we talk about all the different programs we're providing. Um, we talk about well anecdotal evidence. I know there's no doubt in my mind that all of you care deeply about the veterans in the state and the programs, and yet I still am left with the feeling that we have a very disconnected program. And you know, if if one we don't know all the veterans, you know, we we don't have. Uh, the federal government isn't somehow able to provide us um, the contact information of veterans. I'm not asking them to provide confidential medical information or anything else, but if they're not able to provide us information, that's one major roadblock that we have. Um, but two, in my conversations with um, you, Mr. Pedro, you're talking about the fact, I mean, we know that the federal government now is offering um, incentives to businesses to hire veterans, you know, employment credits. But it doesn't seem to me that we have any good way of having our, this is our veteran database with their skills. An employer can go in and easily pull that out and say, okay, these are the 20 veterans that, that uh, meet the job requirements, you know, and, and actually then make some phone calls or or have a way of sending them something online and inviting them to apply for the jobs. We talk about all the different programs, and, you know, um, we, we talked about the gentleman in uh, Placer County who goes out for $17, and yet we talk about how complicated this form is, and but, but yet someone's going out at $17 an applicant and is able to reach many more veterans. Um, I, I often use school examples because I spent 18 years on school board, but we have what's called an individual education plan for students. And if you don't follow that plan, you get sued. And if you make a mistake and you don't change a date, you know, oftentimes you lose fair hearing and you get sued. So we went to a web-based system where you couldn't go to step five if you hadn't done step four, and it resulted in, you know, forms being complete. Um, and it, there were all kinds of benefits from that and reducing our costs. Um, when, when you talk about uh, seventy three percent of the veterans want to be get get their information online instead of in line. There are web based programs where you know it, they should be able to fill out these forms and have enough controls so that if they need information there are are controls there so you don't you know it tells you you have to have this information before the form's complete so we maximize the ability of success so my question to all of you is, and I have thoughts I, but what can we do to try and have a, whether we create a veterans cloud database of information so we can take this information from DMV that we've been collecting from the Paris project, from the money that the assembly has given through the budget for these programs. What can we do to do a better job of collecting information and sharing it and becoming more efficient so that, not with just the goal of saving state money, but with the goal of reaching out to the veterans, you know, making sure they get the benefits they deserve, making sure we're bringing in more federal dollars. All of, I mean, the CVSOs, my understanding is 15% of the funding comes from the state, 85% of the, from the feds. So if we can bring in hundreds of millions or more money from the feds, that's also 
money that, that goes to our veterans but also helps our economy. Uh, I must, so. <coughs> pardon me, Madam Chair. I must correct one thing. CVSOs get no funding from the federal government. Okay. They get the counties provide 85 percent of counties, the funding. Excuse me. I'm and the state averages about 15 percent. So then the counties are, and, and by the way, CVSOs are not a mandated service on the counties. They consider it, for the most part, a moral obligation and are willing to do it, but they have the same budget pressures as the rest of the state does. So uh, CVSOs have probably lost about 50 positions in the last three to four years, would you say, Ted? So, so there's no we, federal dollars for okay, filing claims. I apologize. That's so okay. how do we use technology to to leverage? I mean, I, I, I will give you another example. I mean, uh, Senator Padilla talks about when he was in, on the LA City Council, one of his goals was to expand the number of police officers. They didn't have the money to do that, but they found, for example, if they brought the license plate scanners in and brought other kind of technology in, they could make their force much more efficient and, and in essence, um, uh, achieve the goals of having a larger force. So my question then still goes back to how do we create a uniform database, uh, find a way to leverage? I was, by the way, as you know, at the event where you received that award, and I've seen your apps, and I, I think it's a wonderful start. So how, how do we build on that? Uh, I'll take that one, Madam Chairman. Um, I think what we've heard from uh, a number of the speakers here is the need for a central database, and, and certainly this is the first time this has come up. Uh, if you have a constituent population, it's only a matter of logic that it would, it would make sense to have a central database of record where you have the name, contact information, and social security number. Uh, that currently does not exist. Um, we have a rudimentary database where we, you know, cobbled together to quickly be able to put together some names, but it, it has no real functionality uh, associated with it. So the, the first step is, is doing that. Uh, now, how do we populate it? I think there's two avenues. There's a short term, and there's probably what would be a, the, the, the longer term. The, the short term is to build it and work with our partners, particularly via the Interagency Council on Veterans, which was chartered to do that. And coincidentally, the need for data sharing has come up time and time and time again, uh, is, is to build that and start to, you know, the DMV, for example, they're, they're going to start collecting information on veterans, and we, we get that manually. I recognize they're undertaking a modernization project, and, and when that is over, create an interface. We can start to, once we start to build that database uh, of veterans, we can start to look at that and match it up against quarterly wage data and really start to make some insightful programmatic decisions about how we go and serve veterans. Um, but it really starts with uh, understanding where those veterans are and who they are. Uh, the, the longer term component to that is what I would always refer to as kind of the holy grail. Now, uh, you heard that when a, a veteran separates from service, they receive that two-page DD-214 that says, you know, thank you for your service. Uh, there is currently no automated mechanism, and uh, quite frankly, there's, there's not a manual mechanism to get all of those DD-214s, you know, past, present, and, uh, and, and future. Uh, the California Department of Veteran Affairs is, is working on this with the Department of Defense. I've held some discussions with their chief information officer, who coincidentally is California's previous chief information officer, Terry Takai. Um, and I know the VA, uh, USDVA, has sponsored a, uh, a task force to look into this. We know, and all the other states know, that we cannot begin to serve our veteran population until we know where our veterans are. So, uh, so that's, that's the first step is building the database. Uh, the, the second piece you mentioned uh, is increasing services and benefits. Well, how do we do that via technology? I'm going to use myself as an example. I'm probably the newest veteran in here having uh, just come back from Iraq in August. Um, you know, I, I came back and uh, just want, you know, wanted to get through the process as quickly as possible, filled out the paperwork, got home. And then I got home and I sat there and thought, like, well, you know, I, I injured my leg in Iraq. I, I think I need to go file a disability claim. Fortunately, I work in the office where that's done and the staff work for me. So it was a fairly a seamless process. But what I came to find out in, in that process was – I filed a disability claim, regardless of whether it's 0% or, or more, I can now send my children to college at any uh, CSU or UC uh, for free. I didn't know that. 
what we can do with technology, and, is, and again, it is something that uh, uh, we certainly would like to, uh, to move forward in building, is uh, being able to push that information to veterans. There's enough of the pull mentality. Well, you know, I, I think I want to file a disability claim. If you provide some information uh, about yourself as a veteran, we can begin to offer you a host of services and benefits that you weren't even aware of. And so that kind of refers back to your point of how do we increase, you know, not just federal benefits, but just benefits and services uh, uh, to veterans. Um, the technology is, is, today in 2012 is actually quite simple, exists off the shelf and, and, and rather inexpensive uh, to be able to provision something like that for, uh, for veterans. So that, that, that goes back to, you know, 73% want to work uh, online, not in line. Now the advantage to that is when you begin to push that information out to veterans, it, it not only um, begins to increase the, uh, the benefits and services that uh, in the state that our veterans are getting, but uh, it really allows our department then in terms of the limited 40, 34, or 36 uh, uh, PYs that we have to focus on those most difficult claims. There are some that are just not going to be solved through technology. We need to have that hands-on touch. Uh, and, and that's what technology is supposed to do. It's supposed to automate the things that you know you can automate uh, relatively quickly and straightforwardly and then use the manpower that you have on hand to focus on the core business and some of the more difficult aspects of your business. And that's, what, uh, that, that's something that we uh, would like to move forward with. Lastly, public-private partnerships. There are, and I have been approached uh, on numerous occasions, uh, a number of private sector companies and uh, potential partners out there that want to serve veterans. They just want to know how they can serve veterans. And I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. Um, uh, Microsoft has recently uh, offered up a, a good deal uh, to the California Department of Veteran Affairs to do a proof of concept of uh, what I've just described to you. So we wanted to see, you know, can we do this? And uh, Microsoft, they are committed to serving the veteran community. They've, they've, they've done this for a, a number of years now. Uh, they, they invested in us to go and, uh, and, and begin looking at building this via a proof of concept. And, and I can say that the proof of concept was very, very successful. Uh, but there are others uh, out there that have approached me directly that want to work with us. And that not only um, uh, absorbs that private sector capability, but it really offsets that impact to the state budget when we can get uh, private sector partners to contribute to serve veterans. They're out there. We just need to go and engage them and go get them. Well, I have serious concerns that with the veterans who are going to be coming home, the servicemen and women from Iraq and Afghanistan, as we wind down these two wars, that they're going to come back and they're going to need to be able to easily be connected to those employers that want to put a priority on hiring veterans. That, you know, if, if the, the, the veterans who my generation, the, the Vietnam veterans or my sister's father-in-law, the World War II veterans, that as they age, they're going to need to have access to the proper medical services. And as you pointed out, there can be significant benefits. It's not just a matter of getting them off our Medi-Cal payroll, but there can be significant benefits mm -hmm. to being in the VA program. And, and my concern is that we have a way to do this efficiently and um, and uh, in a way that actually gets ben ben uh, veterans connected with the benefits they deserve. So we, I, I can't see where we can avoid not having a system, a database that that where we can easily access this information. If it means, you know, our executive branch or us in the legislature putting pressure on. Washington, D.C., to be able to provide us with basic information. If it means having a way to match up records, we, we, I don't see how we cannot invest in that because I think all of you are doing wonderful work, mm -hmm. but we may not be doing it in the smartest way possible. And, and we have got to be able to, to, do, um, to act smarter and faster. I, 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 I want to say that I've personally attended stand downs and it's, it's when you see veterans that have been out there homeless and on the streets after they've gone out and, and served our country at war, it's a disgrace. And 
and we need to be able to connect them to those services. Some we may not avoid all of that, but mm-hmm. but we need to be able to connect them to those services in a way that some of these veterans that I've seen, you know, they, they've they've been out of the service for. 20 years or longer, you know, and didn't even know that some of the benefits that were available. So we have, we have, I think, a moral obligation to do a better job here. Uh, Madam Chair, um, just in follow-up, um, uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, uh, you know, personally, uh, over the last five years have been on, uh, I guess, a personal crusade and mission, and it, it's about breaking silos, breaking silos and trying to integrate services delivery. And so far um, in this effort, what I found is you look at it from a number of perspectives, much of uh, complementary what Mark had said, and part of the process and the activity of the Interagency Council on Veterans is uh, looking at these issues and saying what, what, what is getting in the way, what is complicating our ability to integrate these, the, these services, um, and, um, and, and how do we respond to that. And, uh, the, the the activity right now or that has taken place over the course of the last uh, three months prior to the two-day event in Sacramento last week um, was trying to do a, a, a very broad and comprehensive environmental scan. What are the services? Who delivers the services? How are they delivered? And then, and then trying to follow up with the appropriate analytics to, to identify – uh, with regard to the solutions, uh, are, wh- which solutions are technology-based that would solve this problem? Uh, which solutions may be just changing internal administrative policies that are getting in the way? And then also looking at both state and federal legislation and, and looking what are the requirements, what are the definitions, what are the allowable activities? Um, and and, and, and w- one piece of legislation, I mean, um, you know, is it attempt, many times it attempts to address a particular issue or a problem. Um, and then another piece of legislation, and it passes, and then another piece of legislation is introduced and passes that's attempting to deal s- kind of similarly, maybe the same, the same client population, but zeroing in on maybe a different aspect of that. And then what happens is you get one that says these are the people that are eligible, these are the definitions, and these are the outcomes that we're looking for, and then you look at the other one, and th- th- then there's a different eligibility requirement. They're driving to different outcomes, or uh, you're, you're being judged up against different performance measures. And so um, to address even Assemblymember Wagner's um, offer of what can the legislature do, um, uh, one thing is, uh, one thing what I would hope is that we're going to let f- let the Interagency Council on Vets finish some of this work that they're doing, so that um, at a later date we're able to present to this body or any other policy body, both here in California and potentially in the federal government, about what are these uh, intersections or the blockades of these intersections and then be able to examine and say, in, in many respects, we can integrate these programs through a technology solution, and these are the technology, technology solutions that we'd like to pursue. Here are their costs. Is there anybody that can pay for it? Um, the other one is, here are the administrative things that we can do and, and, and engender the, the political will both inside the agencies and the departments and externally to, to, to make those administrative changes but then also to create a roadmap with regard to where is state legislation and where is federal le- legislation uh, contradicting or interfering with each other and potentially can present um, a roadmap from a legislative or a policy perspective about what amendments need to be made, both at the federal level and the state level, to, to, to deal with that barrier so that we can integrate these, these particular programs. That, and, and lastly, it's what we talked about yesterday, <laughs> making sure, uh, although we're, I, I agree with Mark, I mean, we're at a place where it's about transforming. We're trying to get out of the 20th century and into the 21st century and transforming our programs and our services in such a way. Um, and, and as we go through this transformation process, um, it, it's also recognizing that there's going to be costs, there's going to be efforts, and then making sure that all of us are together um, to collectively pursue and speak with a common voice so that there is um, kind of like a collective and an integrated focus towards the solutions to break through these stove, you know, break these silos down, break these stove, 
pipes down um, and, and, and allow all of the various entities that are serving veterans to do it in a much more cooperative, um, uh, uh, collaborative environment, but that our systems uh, interconnect and talk to each other and can track what we're doing. Uh, let me just say this before we go to public comment. I'm a legislator that doesn't believe you need a law to solve every problem, <laughs> okay? Um, and I also, in, in my times I've managed in the private sector, believe in the old adage, don't come to me with problems, come to me with solutions. I'm not going to pretend to know any of your jobs better than you do. Mm -hmm. But I be also believe in data-driven decision-making. And what I've heard over and over again from all of you today is we don't, you know, we, we're still collecting the data. We don't have the data. Anecdotally, we think it's working, you know, and, and we have to have the data. We have to know what's working. We have to know what's not working. And we've got to figure out how we best deliver services. I've heard from Mark that, 73% of our veterans want to, to be able to get online instead of standing in line. So one area that I am interested in pursuing in the budget is um, finding a way, and I know we're in tough, difficult times, but finding a way to begin creating that database because our veterans are coming home. I don't Absolutely. think they can wait. We have other veterans that are, you know, need – need to go into whether it's convalescent hospitals, medical care, whatever, I don't think they can wait. And I think we have got to have a central database, and uh, and we need to have a way that each of you can collect data because I will tell you anecdotal information doesn't cut it. <laughs> and, and, and it shouldn't cut it for you because – you know, I would always ask my employees when I was in the school school board, you, you want to know, okay, so what are the achievement levels? You know, <laughs> that the whole idea is, you know, I'm teaching, how do I know what kids are learning? You're providing all these services, how, you know, how many people you're reaching, what are the co what's the cost of reaching it, are we effective, are we not effective, you know, and, and – Clearly, when we don't even know who our veterans are, it's, it's, it's tough. And I don't blame you for that. I know you're limited with the federal government. But I do think it's time that, at a minimum, we start creating a common database. We have a way that we can um, uh, have easy access to that information. And so that from within that database, the individual populations that each of you are serving – that can be done. And I also do believe that sharing best practices is something you should be doing in any organization, whether it's government or private. There's no reason for people to always have to, to reinvent the wheel. So with that, I want to take public comment. And if there are any additional closing comments, uh, Senator Reagan, we'll, we'll take that. So, sir. Can I mention something briefly? Yeah. We, we, don't, we haven't given you enough information on what CVSOs do, but we have been collecting data for 15 years. It's been audited by CDVA. So when I say that we brought in $3 billion in federal benefits uh, and the state has only put out $36 million, that is verifiable data. And, but I hear everything I, else I you're saying. I appreciate that, but the question is, should, instead of thirty-six million, should it be seventy-two million? And instead of three billion, should it be six billion? I don't know what the answer is. I don't know that you have this exact same veteran population in each community. But as I said, I do know we've got people who are coming home. We're going to need jobs. We have veterans that are aging that also are going to demand services. And, and there, there's got to be a better way of of doing this. So, is there any uh, public comment? Maybe you can uh, just use the microphone there at the uh, – there you go. Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Lynn Snyder. I'm a retired major, 10 years Air Force, 10 years Army, Vietnam veteran. And I've recently been having the pleasure of being assigned as an AmeriCorps representative with CalVet assigned to the Solano County Veterans Office, having the privilege of working with Mr. Pantillo and his veteran service officers. 
I'd just like to address a few comments uh, regarding what Mr. Petrie had said with the out contributing to the outreach program with the DMV. As a result of that program, we have initiated taking each one of those notices that we receive and doing one of three things. Making a personal telephone call, if a telephone number is provided, to contact the veteran. Sending an email in the event that we don't have a telephone. If we don't have a telephone or an email, then we have a form, form letter that we forward to the a veteran. We're finding this to be a very effective program and is a secondary outreach. Uh, Mr. Pentillo has consented because I am also the state secretary for the MOA Council and I'm president of the chapter for <laughs> Solano County Chapter of MOA. In that, I'm also a network contact of which we have 2,200 people that work with trying to assist support veterans in finding jobs. We've been very successful in that, that program. And Ted has consented to taking that program as a part of the outreach program under the AmeriCorps responsibilities. So my portion is working with their office to do extensive outreach, working with all of the elements, all of the associations, EDD, I've worked with Fairfield, Stockton, Solano County, Sonoma County, and other uh, areas to contact veterans. So we are making an effort. Every time we get a notice, we don't set it aside, we make an effort to contact these veterans. I can't agree more that I do believe there is an absolute need for a consolidated database that's gonna give us the opportunity to contact every veteran once they return. And the program that I look at and say is, if each of us hasn't had at least or made contact with one new veteran every day, that, folks, is a bad day. And thanks to the program with the DMV and other input, that helps us eliminate bad days is serving our veterans. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Terry McCarty. Um, still, it's good morning. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I only get up here about twice a year. Uh, I'm an AMVETS member, a state judge advocate. I've also been National 6th District Commander uh, for National. Uh, 35 years law enforcement, Vietnam veteran, uh, um, aviation. And um, through the years, um, we have noticed that uh, one of the one of the first chances we have to identify veterans is when they get off the plane, <laughs> or they're getting uh, um, they're leaving service. But of course, first thing you want to do is get out of town and go see your people and your girlfriend and everything else, and that's all understandable. But that's probably the fastest way and the easiest way for us as organizations to get the information. If we can't get it at that first point, then I suggest that we offer uh, some type of a discount at, let's say, DMV. Bring your DD-214 and we'll give you 20% off on your license and registration. Huh. We got it then, okay? Um, one of the first, the first thing I do when I have a, a veteran come back and I know he's got PTSD, is I take him by the hand, because they don't know what they're going to be doing. Where are we going? We're going to the VA hospital. Why? You're going to get a VA card. Why do I need that? <laughs> you will. Then the next thing I do is I take them to a service officer. And they sit down and say, well, 
what kind of problems? Well, I got blown up and my arm's all messed up and my head's not, not too good. And, okay, and get a claim going. So now we have, maybe we've got the VA, you got a card, and now we've got a claim, at least started, and maybe we get him a DMV if we don't get him anyplace else. But that's how we get, that's how we generate the numbers and find out where they're really at. Um, some of them we will never get. Um, I have 35 years in law enforcement, uh, the last 20 years with the Orange County District Attorney's Office. Um, one of the best places to find homeless veterans uh, is, is under um, uh, freeway overpasses or downtown or in front of uh, City Hall in, in a, a doorway. Uh, are you a veteran? Yeah. You got a VA card? Well, no. Get them up, throw them in your car, dust them off and say, come on. But it, it, it takes boots on the ground to get it done. Or we try to get them when they first come or they're getting out. Or eventually, if we can get them at DMV. And that's how we get our data together to find out how many we really have. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any, any other uh, testimony? Do you have any closing remarks you'd like to make? No, no thank you. We'd appreciate all of you being here today. Yeah, and I want to thank everyone for coming and, and testifying. And if there's any uh, issue in the state capitol, it should be a bipartisan issue. It's uh, it's veterans. And um, my hope is that, uh, you know, we do, like I said, uh, get out of the box and figure out what we can do to um, provide these services uh, more um, e efficiently. I'm, I'm here to, we're here to support if, uh, the federal government uh, providing us with names to make the contact easier um, because I, I, I know we're, we're never going to live in a perfect world but it's there's something wrong when you have to you know go into a, under the freeway or or into a doorway and say are you a vet and do you have a, a VA card I mean there's got to be a better way of identifying and, and, and delivering the services um, our, our veterans are entitled to. So thank you very much. If any of you have any further comments, you're free to uh, meet with any of us anytime and uh, look forward to our uh, next hearing when we start to dig into the budget issues. And I also look forward to getting your Paris report and any other information any of you have uh, for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.